God is so good. <laughs> and, um, you know, I don't go, um, I go places because there's people, right? God's children. And uh, like the first sermon last week, uh, everyone is priceless, you know, just priceless. And, and uh, we can't imagine how, how valuable we are. And it's a privilege to be able to be here and to be with so many priceless ones. And uh, it's a privilege to be here and to get to know you and, and uh, to be here and spend time together. And I can only imagine what heaven is like. And I am looking forward to it by God's grace. Now, um, tonight, uh, we're going to talk about a number of topics, whatever I can get in tonight. <laughs> There's more than we can cover in this uh, particular series, but I do want to try to bring things together, wrap things up, and cover um, what I understand uh, God is telling me are the most important topics that we need to cover together. Uh, one of those is uh, escaping the bitterness trap. Now, bitterness, why do we have bitterness? We have bitterness because of justice. Um, that's really the foundation of where bitterness comes from. And when it comes to sin and justice, we understand that only God is God. He said, for you are great and do wondrous things, you alone are God. Right? And we understand that God is just, but his justice is for others' sake, not for his own. He is selfless. And so all his ways are justice, a God of truth, and without injustice, righteous and upright is he. And we also know that, and we see from Scripture, that sin is against God. Sin is a breaking of his law. And we're told against you, you only have I sinned and done this evil in your sight. Quite an interesting statement because David had done some very real things to real people. Karim Bathsheba and Uriah and uh, some others. And so he had done these things to them, but he could honestly pray against you, you only have I sinned and done this evil in your sight. Uh, according to what we looked at last night, Jesus becomes the victim of everything that ever happens, right? The perpetrator of, of those things at the cross. And so David, having come and accepted that through the, the, the service of the lamb, at that time, looking forward in faith to the Lamb of God who was going to take away the sin of the world, he could honestly say against you, you only have I sinned and done this evil in your sight. And sin is the transgression of the law. Whose law? God's law, right? So sin is always against God. And sin necessitates a penalty, and that penalty is death. For the wages of sin is death. And who is it that must administer the penalty? God, right? So God is the one who must uphold his law. He is the one who must administer or exact the penalty. He could delegate that to an agent, and sometimes he does. Angels at times have been those agents. Sometimes it's been God's people that have been those agents as well. But he says, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. And only when the penalty is paid in full, then justice is satisfied, justice is complete, right? So this is what, how sin and justice bear to each other, but what does this have anything to do with bitterness? Well, in bitterness, there is a deception, and that deception is that I believe that I'm God, right? I take the place of God, and so what you did, you did against me. It's personal. And that sin that you committed to me, against me, requires a penalty. And I must uphold justice. But my justice is for who? For me. Right? It's a selfish justice. And so I must uphold justice for myself's sake. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to extract that penalty from you so that you pay for what you did. And you will only go free when you have paid that penalty in full. And if you don't pay that penalty in full, you're never going free. This is the foundation of bitterness. This is the foundation of bitterness. 
Now, we can understand it in the concept of a prison. Okay, so you did me wrong, I am, and for that, I am going to put you in prison. I'm going to put you in prison, and you're going to stay in that prison until you pay for everything. And if you cannot pay, then you'll never get out, and the reality is you can't pay, and you'll never get out. Because no matter, uh, it, no, um, no measure of good done after the evil takes away the evil that was done. If you haven't murdered anybody in the last 10 years, that does not take away the fact that you did murder somebody before that time. If you did, in fact, do that. Right? So the good after does not negate the evil done before. And so it can never be paid for. You can never undo what was done. So this is the deception. Why is it a deception? Well, if you're going and you're looking through bars and you're looking across at somebody else, you just might find yourself in a situation where instead of them being inside and you outside, it's you inside and them outside, which is the reality. And the reality is that you did what you did to God. It wasn't to me, right? because I'm not my own. I was bought at a price. Therefore, glorify God in my body and my spirit, which are his, right? So it's not mine. Anything that's done to me is done to God because I belong to him. So it wasn't me that they did it to. And I am the one who is in prison. I'm the one that's shut up behind those bars, and I will stay in prison until you pay for everything that you did. But guess what? You can't pay. So guess what? I'll never get out. Right? I'll never get out. I'm my own jailer. I'm my own prison warden. Holding myself in captivity, hoping that you'll pay uh, by me being in that captivity. Right? And in order for me to go free, I must be willing to let you go free. But I don't want to let you go free because if you go free, then my sense of justice will not be satisfied. And I won't be fair. It won't be fair. You'll get away with it. See the problem? Yeah. It's a crazy problem. <laughs> but welcome to a crazy world with crazy people. Amen. Right? And it's not the neighbor. The crazy one sitting in your seat. <laughs> and standing in my shoes. Right? So... The key out is the key of forgiveness. And I'm standing in the jail cell holding the key. Right? And I refuse to use the key because I'm afraid if I do, you're going to go free. Right? So I've got the key. I can let you out. But if I do, you're going to go free, and I don't want you to go free. And so what do I do? I, what is this whole bitterness thing? The hurt that I have because of what you said and what you did and how I took it personally and what it did to me, then I try to hold on to that hurt. I try to, I try to nurse that hurt. I try to stay close to that hurt. I try to feel that hurt. I, I, I do this over and over again, so hoping that I can draw you into the hurt so that you can feel the hurt too. Now, it's like a fire. <laughs> Who gets burned the most? The ones that's closest to the fire or the one that's farther away? The one that's closest to the fire. <laughs> and who is it that's harboring the fire? I am. So who gets burned? Me, right? And, and there's no guarantee that the other person will ever get burned at all. In fact... They might just roast their marshmallows over me <laughs> and find it amusing. And me never get that thing paid for, right? So no measure of suffering can undo the past. So therefore, I will remain captive. I'll remain captive. 
because I'm unwilling to let you go free. And if I let go of those hurt feelings, then I have nothing to hold you to. And justice will not be met. Justice will not be met. So I keep holding on to those feelings in order to extract that justice from you, that penalty from you. And that is the foundation of bitterness. It's crazy, but that's what it is. And there is also not just a deception of bitterness, but there is a deception of forgiveness as well. And this is the usual, typical understanding of forgiveness in the Christian context. And so that Christian understanding of forgiveness is, well, you sinned against me, and you owe me for what you did, and, but, you know, I'm just going to not make you pay for what you did, and I'm going to graciously set you free. So, therefore, I forgive you. Is this not what we do? Yeah, this is forgiveness as we understand it. But is it truly forgiveness? Is it something that truly sets you free? No. What's the problem? What's the problem here? I'm still God. I'm still God. And you still did it against me. And you still owe me, but by my own graciousness, I'm going to set you free. And if you are God in the process of forgiveness, you will never go free because you can't set yourself free. Neither can you set anyone else free. It just can't happen. It's not your capacity. So what is the reality of forgiveness? The reality of forgiveness is it happens all at the cross. <laughs> it all happens at the cross. So in doing what you did to me, you sinned against God because I'm not my own. It's against him. And besides, I came to the cross and I accepted that divine exchange on my behalf, and so Jesus took my place. Not only am I not my own, but now Jesus comes and he takes my place for everything that has ever happened in my life. And so you don't owe me anything. There is no debt that you have to me because it's not me. What you did, you did against God. And so your debt is with him. And frankly, <laughs> I'm absolutely amazed that God set me free. And how gracious he was to me to set me free from being such a miserable wretch. I mean, really, just a scoundrel. And, uh, and, 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 so, and so praise God, hallelujah, for that wonderful grace that set me free. And, and, and I, 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 because he loves me and because he loves you, I love you. And I want you to go free just like he set me free. And you can go free the same way and in the same place that I did. So if there's anything that I can do to help you to come to the cross and to help you to find that freedom too, I'm willing to do it. Right? So bitterness is resolved at the cross. It's resolved at the cross. Right? It's not resolved in an interaction with another individual. It's resolved at the cross in an interaction with Jesus. It's the only place that bitterness is resolved. And it's not when I'm God, it's when he's God. And that's important, it's important. Now, it's true that uh, when we come to God, you know, there's confession and there's repentance, which includes sorrow for sin and a turning away from it. And there's proper restoration as well. You know, Leviticus talks about that as well. Um, you know, about returning a fifth if you had stolen things or you had, uh, you know, damaged goods of somebody else. Well, it's appropriate to go about that restitution process. And, 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 it's, and, and, and it's, it's beneficial, it's needful for us to go through that too. Right? And 
And if somebody comes to us and they say, well, you know, I did this stuff to you, we're like, well, hey, you know, it's not a problem for me. <laughs> yeah, I was wrong, but you did it to God. And I don't hold anything against you. You want me to tell you how I went free? And why I'm not bitter with you about, you know, the, the stuff that you did or the stuff that you said? Yeah, let me tell you about it. And if you have done things to others and you come to the cross and you go free, well, it's still appropriate to go to them and say, you know what? That was wrong. That was wrong. And I acknowledge that was wrong. It should never have happened. And I don't have an excuse for it. And I praise God that though I had held, held on to guilt for so many years for those things that I did to you and I said to you, I was finally able to come to the cross and Jesus set me free. And he took my place and he took my sin. And I don't stand under that condemnation anymore. And, and I just want to tell you that, um, that I'm sorry for what happened. I can't undo it. But if there's anything that I can do, please let me know. I'd be willing to do so. And I want you to be free too, <laughs> just like Jesus set me free. And if there's any time you're interested in me walking with you, you through that, you know, how I went free, let me know. I'll be happy to, to walk with you through that process. Right? So how do I know that my bitterness is resolved? Right? Like, did it work? Did it not work? Well, I still remember what happened, but there's no more pain with the memory. Right? You don't forget, because if you forgot, you'd have, no, you'd have no witness. You'd never be able to tell anybody anything. You know? People would be like, why are you so happy? I don't know, but I'm happy. <laughs> I'm free. Well, how'd you go free? I don't know. But I'm free, and I like free. Well, I'm not free. How do I go free? I don't know. But I'm free, and it's nice to be free. No, you remember the stuff. He doesn't just wipe out your memory. So, so yes, you remember, but the pain goes away. There's no more pain associated with the memory. Then you know you're free. Because God heals the hurt. So, with everything that we have learned so far, I have a question. Well, I have lots of questions. <laughs> Who can hurt me? No one. Right? No one can hurt me. Only I can hurt myself. You see, it's only I that can breathe for myself. It's only I that can eat for myself. It's only I that can drink for myself. It's only I that can think for myself. And it's only what I breathe, what I eat, what I drink, not what you eat, not what you breathe, not what you drink that destroys me or provides what I need. And it's only what I think that impacts my body and my health and my outcomes, not what you think, until I make it what I think, right? until I make it my own. Right? So another person or a group of people or whoever, a whole family of people, might be around you and have all sorts of hurtful actions and words and other things of that nature in a hurtful environment. But guess what? God's buffet of love, still there. It's still available. Even when somebody is trying to curse you down one side and up the other, God's there with blessings. You are my child whom I love. With you I am well pleased. Why? Because we've entered into the cross. We have the life of Christ in our behalf. Right? He, he's well pleased with us. And so regardless of what somebody is doing around us and how they're behaving, that doesn't determine our outcome. What determines our outcome is who we're taking from. Right? Who do I take from? It's my option to either think and take from their environment or to think and take from his environment. And that determines my outcome. Right? So I can never be controlled and manipulated by others. Unless I eat from their buffet. Right? 
unless I eat from their buffet. So Martha, she, um, uh, she and Herb were married about 35 years. Uh, they had a relatively good marriage. He was a traveling salesman. He was gone during the week, home on the weekends. Um, and, uh, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't the best thing in the world, but it, it went well. They never had children together. She took care of the home. He took care of the finances, um, you know, and, and so on. And so things were, things were fine. She was doing okay until the day, until the day she found out. Now, what did she find out? Well, she found out that Herb was not exactly being faithful to her. In fact, for the whole 35 years, he had not been faithful to her. He had another family in another city. She was wife number two, and he had children with the other woman. And he was with her during the week and with, uh, with Martha on the weekend. Yeah, imagine pulling that off for 35 years. Wow. <clears throat> you know? Yeah, I mean, this is before cell phones and all that kind of stuff, so communication is a little bit more difficult. And, and, and so anyways, you can imagine your whole life just goes... <clears throat> because everything you thought was, wasn't. Right? Everything you thought was, wasn't. And so you can imagine she had a little bit of consternation going on. She was uh, having difficulty sleeping because she had all these thoughts running through her head. All right, so now what's going to happen? Um, because I'm not going to put up with him being with, you know, we're not going to continue this situation anymore. But he's her only source of financial support. And uh, she doesn't have career skills. Her family's dead. Uh, so she doesn't have anybody else to rely upon. So how is this going to work out? And so she's worried. She's trying to figure this stuff out. There's, you know, and so she's not sleeping very well. And this is getting problematic. And so she goes and sees her physician. And her physician puts her on some sleeping medication to help her out with that. And then she starts getting some pain here and some pain there and a pain in another place. And the pain's starting to get more and more severe. And then it starts involving some of her organs. And then they start getting involved. And three years after this discovery, she's fallen apart. I mean, just absolutely falling apart physically. Autoimmune condition, eating up the kidneys and, and some of the other organs, and it's just, she's, sometimes we say in the healthcare industry, she's circling the drain. Right? Circling the drain. So, what was the cause of Martha's decline? It, that's right. Her, her, her decline was not Herb's infidelity. That was not the cause. It was her thinking about Herb's infidelity and her situation, believing that it was about her, that he deserved to treat her a certain way, and so she deserves attention and belonging and harmony and security and all these other things from him. And that when he, he, she came to this discovery, it was her loss. Because it was her marriage, it was her husband, it was her life, it was her everything. And so she took it personal when it came along. She went into that marriage as an eater. So she might eat from her the rest of her life. She didn't go into that marriage as a feeder to feed her for the rest of the life. Right? And so she began to fall apart. Right? She began to fall apart. Now, does he have responsibility? Yes. yes, absolutely. I'm not saying that he doesn't have any responsibility. He absolutely has responsibility, and God will hold him to that responsibility. But regardless of what he did, he could not cause her to decline like this because the decline did not come from outside. The decline came from inside, came from inside. Right. And so while she doesn't know what she's doing to herself, and while we would not condemn her for the situation that she's in, because she doesn't know any better, because she, she you know, she's stuck. But yet we could provide her hope that she doesn't have to keep going down the same pathway. Right? 
Yeah, she was thinking it's mine. Now, could she be grateful? Was there anything to be grateful for? Well, sure. Could she be thankful for God's support over all of those years? Yeah, the good weekends that they spent together and so on? Yeah. Now, if gratitude would have been her response to the situation, what would her health outcome be like three years later? Would it be the same as we find her in now? No, no it would be different. Because gratitude never does you harm. Gratitude only does good. We're told, give thanks in all things. You mean even when I find out my husband's been unfaithful or my wife's been unfaithful to me for the last 35 years of our marriage? Give thanks in all things? Well, yeah, that's what the text says. Give thanks in all things. Why? Because always in all things, there's always something to be thankful for. Always. If you go looking for it, you will find it. If you don't think to look for it, you won't find it. But if you go looking for it, you will. And gratitude never does the body bad. It always does the body good. Right? So it's not what happened to her, but it's what she thought about what happened to her that led to her decline. That's not an isolated case. Right? Margaret, uh, she came to see Horst <laughs> a number of years ago. Um, and uh, she was suffering from a few different things. She was coughing, cough, 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 cough all over the place. And this was, this was pre-COVID. Now it'd be even worse. And everybody, you know, somebody just clears their throat, <clears throat> and everybody's like, Poof. <laughs> you know. And, uh, but, you know, still, I mean, pre-COVID, coughing, nobody wants somebody coughing all over you. And she couldn't stop it. She was just hacking her lungs out. And she was coughing, coughing, coughing. Nobody could figure out what was going on. And just about the time she started developing this nagging cough, she also developed urinary incontinence. <laughs> cough, <clears throat> you know. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, you, you, you cough and leak and cough and leak and cough and leak. And so, you know, people don't like you off coughing in their face or leaking on their furniture. And, and so, you know, social life was just, you know, I mean, it, 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 was, it was bad. And this was going on for about two years or so that she had this condition that was there. And she had been to specialist and specialist and here and there, and they had tried this medication and this procedure and these scans and this stuff and couldn't figure out what was going on. And so she went to go see Horst. He's an ear, nose, throat specialist. And, uh, and so, you know, sometimes you can have chronic coughing because of uh, postnasal dra drainage and sinus issues and whatever. And so he saw her, sent her for a CT scan to check the sinuses, make sure everything's okay. Uh, nothing that's there, you know, but of course he knows about the law of life. And, and so he's like, all right, there's got to be a cause. So time frame, all right, this has been going on for a couple of years. Well, so what happened before the couple of years? Right. So starts out, you know, do you want to come back? Let's talk and see if we can discover what's going on. Well, a few months before she started this condition, she was uh, starting into an argument with her daughter in regards to the boyfriend. She hated his guts. She didn't want the daughter to have anything to do with the boyfriend. And, uh, you know, this became a point of contention. Daughter was about 17-ish or so, and daughter got fed up with this, and she left home and moved in with a boyfriend. And now communication is at a distance over the phone. And, uh, and so, you know, when you start having a conversation and it starts heading in that direction and mom's trying to then control daughter in order to make sure that she behaves well and doesn't, you know, whatever, the daughter can just get the phone and go, whoop, done, done with the conversation. You think she took that well? No. <laughs> leak, leak. And... So on, right? So shortly after this, it develops. Well, this has still been a contentious issue. Now, does love control others? No. Love gives freedom. Love can only exist within the context of freedom. Now, uh, you know, this is not a two-year-old. This is a 17-year-old. Do you think the 17-year-old knows what's good and what's not? Yes, yeah, yeah, they do. 
whether they, whether they acknowledge it or not, they know what mom's going to say is good or what mom's going to say is not good. Whether they want to adhere to that or not, that's a whole different issue. But they sure know. And, you know, once they've been in the home for 17 years, you don't have to tell them again. They know, right? It's not an issue of knowing. It's an issue of the heart, right? And so she's trying to control her daughter. She can't stand the guy who took her away from her. She lost her only child in this whole situation, and her child, who was her source, is not behaving well. So guess what? Life is not going well. <clears throat> so what kind of love does she need? She needs God's love for her daughter and the boyfriend so that she can come and she can take from God's love and she can be full, she can be satisfied with him, she can have all of the acceptance, all of the harmony, all of the security, all of the belonging, all of the, the compassion, all of the everything that she needs from God, she can come and take it, and then, and the freedom, the liberty, and then give it to her daughter. Don't pester her, don't bug her, don't go there, let her live how she's living, right? She's not yours, she's his. Let him work on her heart and you simply be there as a resource when she thinks she needs you. But you love her in your thoughts so that when she does communicate with you, you can love her in your words and your actions as well and the boyfriend too, right? So every morning I want you to go out and spend time in nature and come and take from God and take from his love and take of that love that provides that freedom and give it away to her and give it away to the boyfriend so that you can love them. Well, she's desperate, you know, nothing else has worked and so why not? I mean, this is crazy, but why not? And so she goes and she starts doing it. And he had a repeat appointment with her about three weeks or so later. And he was running about an hour late. And he was surprised to find her in the waiting room. Why? She wasn't coughing. And guess what? She wasn't leaking either. <laughs> Why? Well, was it all just in her head? No. There was very real physical stuff going on in the body. But the foundation of the issue was in the mind. A selfish love for herself, seeing herself as the one at personal loss, trying to control somebody else, having hatred for the boyfriend, that is not God's love. And that is not God, how God created her. And she was not going to function appropriately if she was outside of his creation. And so the fix of that was to come and take that love, that kind of love that she needed from God, so that she could then give it on to others. She could take to give. And when that got restored, it was the foundation of her physical ailments, and they went away. When the cause was removed, the effect ceased. Now, I don't need, like I say, I think I already told you Michelle's story. She came to us with ovarian cancer. She was one of my patients. And, uh, you know, stage 3C, I think. She had uh, 11 tumors in her abdomen, two rounds of chemotherapy. Every round of chemotherapy, everything got bigger, got worse. They were talking experimental, and she decided, uh-uh, go on to Yuchi. And so she came to Yuchi Pines. And uh, so, you know, we did the usual stuff, put her on a healthy diet and hydrotherapy and herbs and, you know, that kind of stuff. And, uh, but... I recognize that she had bitterness against her mother for her mother always, well, her mother dropped her off with the grandparents at eight years of age so the grandparents could raise her so the mother could go do her party life of drugs and significant others and, you know, that kind of stuff and then would come back into the, her life periodically and create ca chaos and havoc because she was, now, now mother was jealous of her relationship with the grandparents who she saw as her parents and, uh, you know, and so on. So there was a lot of chaos there and she never knew who her father was, never saw him, didn't even know his name and, and whatever. 
but the real issue was the mother, and she had a lot of resentment, a lot of bitterness in her, in her heart for her mother. And I knew that that resentment and bitterness was not going to help her situation. And so, again, talked about the same types of things, you know. You, you're not loving her, and you can't love her unless you come and you take that love from God, that love that will allow your mom to be free, to be as crazy as she wants to be, and you don't have to be dependent upon her because she's not your source anymore. God is your source, and you can come take everything that you need from him, and he's stable. He is consistent. You can come and you can take from him and get exactly what you need. And you can be full. So spend that time taking from him so that you're full and not, let your mom be crazy. Let her be her way, but love her anyways, right? Well, her cancer markers came back to normal by the end of the session, two and a half weeks later. And she was, you know, she was ecstatic and gave a great testimony and so on. And a couple of months later, five, uh, five of the tumors were left. Six had disappeared, and the five that were left were smaller than the ones that had, you know, than, than they had seen on the scans previously, and she's all ecstatic, and that's great. And a couple months later, she's calling, boo-hoo-hoo-hoo-hoo, why? Because the cancer markers are back up again. What happened? Mom came back. And she forgot pretty much everything that we talked about. And, you know, so she's taking it personal and she's bitter about that mom and all that kind of stuff. And so we spent a time again working through this. Remember, mom's not your source. You, God is your source. He's there and he's available. Even if she's being crazy, he's there. He's not crazy. Come, take from him and let her be free. She can, you know, are you ever going to fix her? No, you're not going to fix her. If God can fix her, let him fix her. But it's not going to be you. Right? And, and, and sure, pray for her. Love her. Take that love from God and give it to her. A couple months later, cancel markers back in the normal range. Right? And she's still alive. It's about six years later or so. She's a friend on Facebook. Right? So was the cancer all in her head? No, it was in her belly. <laughs> but the foundation was in her mind. Right? The inability to love her mother, the resentment and the bitterness and so on, was the foundation of it. And when that was dealt with, well, the cancer went away. Right? We're told sickness of the mind prevails everywhere. Nine-tenths of the diseases from which men suffer have their foundation here. That's why I'm doing this series. Right? Because this is what we see. It's potent. I mean, we don't realize how potent it is. And until we do, then we're not, sometimes not willing to go there, <laughs> right? To go there. Oh, sure, we're willing to do this, we're willing to do that, we're willing to change this and, you know, change how we eat or change how we exercise or, or go do this treatment or go do that thing. But when it comes to that heart change, we're like, eh, 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 mm -mm, mm -mm. Yeah, not ready for that. Okay? Okay? You're not ready to get well either. <laughs> if you're not ready for that, you know, to go there. It's a hard issue. It's really a hard issue. Now, some people really struggle with negative thoughts. Right? That was my life, struggling with negative thoughts. I didn't know I could go a minute without having this stuff running through my head all the time. All the time, just negative thoughts running through my head. So how does one then overcome negative thoughts, right? What is that process? Well, first of all, we need to recognize that thoughts, again, are based upon information. And that information is either truth, which comes from God, or it's lies, which come from the enemy. And, or it's a mixture of truth and lies, which comes from the enemy as well, right? And I must evaluate every thought against the standard of truth to discern whether it comes from one or whether it comes from the other. So what is that standard of truth? Yeah, it's the word of God, right? It's the word of God, it's the law of God. That's the standard by which I need to evaluate everything to determine whether it's true or not. So we're told in Hebrews 4 and verse 12, for the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. You want to know, right, what you think 
and what your motivations are, just bring your stuff to the word and it will reveal it to you eventually. Right? Because, well, Because what's inside gets spilled out, and then you can see it. Oh, praise God. Praise God for those opportunities. You know, when you get spilled out, it's an opportunity. It's an opportunity, right, to learn. It's, a, it's an educational opportunity. All right, so how do we, all right, well, we'll, we'll begin this Overcoming Negative Thoughts class by Class 101, how to fail at overcoming negative thoughts. Yeah. All right, so how do we fail at overcoming negative thoughts? Try not to think about the negative thoughts. Right. Yeah. If you simply try not to think about the negative thoughts, you will fail at overcoming the negative thoughts. It won't work, because all you do the whole time you're trying to not think about the negative thoughts is thinking about the negative thoughts that you're trying not to think about. That's all you do. It doesn't work. Why? Because the mind was created to be occupied. It was not created to be empty space. We're told, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Meditate or think upon these things. Occupy till I come. It is an occupation, right? Christian meditation is not about emptying one's mind. It's about filling the mind, Amen. right? It's about filling the mind. Now, there's this whole Eastern concept of meditation, and that Eastern concept of meditation is about emptying the mind so that the inner voice or the inner knower or God or whoever can speak to you. Uh-uh. No, false. I've been down that road. It didn't work well in the end, right? It didn't work well in the end because the enemy looks just like God. He sounds just like God. It's beautiful. It's wonderful. But you know he can turn himself into an angel of light? He, st he was a covering cherub. He was in the presence of God. He knows what it's like to be in there. He knows how to reproduce it. Oh, it can be beautiful, absolutely beautiful. And I'm just telling you from personal experience. But over time, imperceptibly, you get led just a little bit away, a little bit away, a little bit away, a little bit away, and more and more and more and more. And you get more and more in tune to the voice inside and less attuned to the word outside. And so you take away the comparison, you take away the measure, and you start imperceptibly moving off in this direction. No, Christian meditation is about filling the mind with the things of God, right? <clears throat> so the mind was created to be occupied. So if I simply try to create empty space, it's not going to work because it was created to be occupied. So the mind also can only focus on one thing at a time. Praise God, hallelujah, this is our way out, right? This is our way out. So let's put this to practice and the displacement principle. So, don't think about the fat lazy cat. <laughs> All right. Don't think about the fat lazy cat. Come on now, stop. Stop thinking about the fat lazy cat. No, no, stop thinking about that. I'm going to stop thinking about that. Oh, it's so cute. Look at him. He really is fat. No, no, no stop thinking. What are you doing when you just try to stop think, thinking about the fat, lazy cat? Think about it. You're just thinking about the fat, lazy cat. It just doesn't work. So if you're going to forget the fat, lazy cat, think about the happy dog. <laughs> right? Isn't he happy? Yeah. If you could see really well, like on the screen over here, you could tell that he's he recently got a bath, unlike a dog that I know of somebody around here. Um, <laughs> Unless it recently got a bath in the last hour or two. Um, so, so, yeah, it recently got a bath and whatever. And I wonder, you know, Photoshop is just so amazing at what it can do. I'm just wondering if they kind of got Photoshop and just meh, pulled that edge a little bit more and pulled that edge a little bit more to make it look like a smile. Where'd the cat go? 
Where'd the cat go? Yeah, he's over there. But you can't focus on the dog and focus on the cat at the same time. It's impossible. So the, the key to overcoming negative thoughts is to actively think about something else. All right? So we're told in 2 Corinthians 10 and verse 5, casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every, how much? Every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. All right. So this is our privilege to take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. It's our privilege. And, and every command in the word is a promise. Every command is a promise because along with the command comes the promise of the power to actually accomplish it. So if you try to do it because the command says to do it, you'll never be able to do it. But if you try to do it because the command says do it and you know he will give you the power to do it, so you trust him to give you the power to do it, then you can do it. Because you can't do it by your power, but you can do it by faith in his power to do it. Right? So... Let's take some real negative thoughts, not just fluffy cats. All right, so failure. This is one of the ones that I struggled with. You know, when you've got addictions and so on, and you promise God and you fail, and you promise and you fail, and you promise and you fail, go back and, you know, you, you're a failure. You feel like you're a failure. So I can't do it, right? I can't do it. And I, I can try all I want to. It's not going to work. I can't do it. I, so why even try? I can't overcome, so why even try to overcome? So is that a God thought or not a God thought? Not. That's not a God thought, right? What's a God thought? I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, right? So how do we battle practically? Right? How do we battle practically? Well, you take... That promise, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, you take this nice, dangerous piece of paper, called a three by five card, right? Dangerous, why? Because with paper, you can defeat the enemy. And a simple prayer of faith, thank you, Lord, for giving me the truth of your word, right? So it's acknowledging that God's word is true. I choose to believe whatever the promise says, that I will overcome. Why? Because you said so, you're faithful. Thank you for helping me overcome. So it's acknowledging his word is true, it's choosing to believe what the promise says, and it's thanking him for accomplishing the promise. So you take the promise, and you take that little prayer of faith, and you have it on a three by five card. And the moment you realize, now, it could have been going on for a long time, but the moment you realize you're thinking negative thoughts, the I can'ts, the failure thoughts, you pull out your three by five card and you read it out loud because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, and you read it out loud. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, Philippians 4.13. Thank you, Lord, for giving me the truth of your word. I choose to believe that I will overcome because you said so. Thank you for helping me overcome. And you trust that the one who gave those words is the one that will back up those words and will give you power to actually believe and overcome. And so you do so and you get done. Guess how you feel? Great. Not yet. <laughs> well, when you believe, yes, you do. You do. But in personal experience, you get done reading that the first time and you feel just as miserable as you did before. What do you do? Read it again. Read it again. That's right. Do it again until you believe it, right? It's a battle, like an old-fashioned battle. Spears, swords, axe, whatever, all that kind of stuff. No, this long-distance guns and everything else like that. It's hand-to-hand -hand combat. And if you've got the enemy lined up over there and you're lined up with your motley crew over on this side and the enemy engages in battle, what do you want to have with you? Yeah, you want something to be in the battle with, right? The sword of the Spirit, the Word of God, Ephesians 6, 17. 
So that's what you want to have with you, the word of God. And that's what that is. It's the sword of the spirit. It's the word of God. And you go to battle. Now, if you go to the battlefield and you left your sword at home, is that going to do you any good? No, nope, dead meat. Right? Now, if you went to the battlefield and you brought your sword with you and you leave it in its sheath, is that going to do you any good? No. no, you're still dead meat, about as fast as you were before. If you take the sword out and you take one whack at the enemy, whoosh, and then you put it back in a sheath, but the enemy is still engaged, well, guess what? You're still dead meat. The only way you're going to survive the battle if is, is what? The sword out, and you use it as long as the enemy is engaged. And the enemy is engaged here. He's engaged in the mind. It's a battle of the mind, right? It's a battle of the thoughts. And as long as you have that negative thought, I can't do it, you pull out the sword of the Spirit, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, and that prayer of faith, and you go through that until the negative thought goes bye-bye. It's like overcoming a smoking habit. When somebody stops smoking, what do they get? They start getting withdrawals and they get urges. They get an urge to smoke, right? And the urge will come and it'll hit you and it'll hit you hard. But it'll only last for a minute to two two and a half minutes max. And then guess what happens? Backs off, right? Gets better. And it'll stay better for a little bit and then it'll hit you again. And it'll hit hard for a minute to two. And then it'll back off for, for a little while. And then it'll hit you hard again. So when somebody's overcoming smoking, I tell them, don't worry about not smoking the rest of the day. But come on. You can get through two minutes, can't you? Oh, yeah. yeah, I can do two minutes. Yeah, so don't worry about the rest of the day. You just worry about this two minutes right now, right? God will give you strength for two minutes, can he? Yeah, get through these two minutes right now, and then it'll back off. The same thing happens with the thoughts. It'll hit you hard, and it'll hit you hard for a couple of minutes, and then it'll back off, right? So you end up battling, but then there's a break. And then you battle, and then there's a break. And then you battle, and then there's a break. And then the break gets longer. And the battle's not so hard as you keep going along the line. And it eventually gets to the point where things really begin to change. You see, we all have, we've got all sorts of neural pathways that we have uh, in our mind. There's that neuroplasticity. Now, why is that the case? Well, it's not that the brain changes itself. It doesn't have the capacity to do so. It's the spirit that's changing the brain. Right? It's the activity of the spirit that's working on the brain that's causing the changes. Right? And when you believe in a particular thought pattern in a particular way, then that reinforces connections between neurons that are involved in that thought process, and you get super highways that are going on in your head, and it's really easy to go down that way. Now, I used to live in Nicaragua. We, my wife and I lived there for a year, and this is what it looks like going into the jungle. Right? There, it, there's all sorts of stuff that's grown up around. It's typically pretty wet, which you can see it's kind of wet, muddy down there. And the, the, the villagers will go marching off through the jungle to go to their farms and wherever else. And there's this nice pathway. And if you want to go in the jungle, well, hey, just get on the path and go. It's easy. But if you want to turn to the right and you want to turn to the left and go down that way, good luck. Because there's all sorts of stuff in your way. There's trees and there's bushes and there's vines and there's all sorts of things. So if you're going to get off the path and go a different direction, you've got to have something. Yeah, you've got to have your sword. And at the beginning, it's a lot of whack, 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 not much movement. Because there's so much stuff in your way. 
So there's a lot of whack whack, a lot of you know fighting and, and so on. You're getting the three by five card out, and you're not making very much dis different. I mean, distance. You know, when you do this, and it and you're tempted to go, oh man, this isn't working. Hang on, that's failure thought. No, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. <laughs> Philippians 4:13. Uh, Thank you, Lord, for giving me the truth of your word. I choose to believe that I will overcome because you said so. Thank you for giving me freedom. Right. And, and, and so you continue to do so. And if you do, and then you come back and you get a little bit farther and you get back to it and you get a little farther and you get back to it and you get a little farther and then you go back through that pathway again and you start cleaning some other stuff out of the way. And as you continue to do so, the new pathway opens up. And if you stop going on the old pathway, guess what happens there? It starts growing over. Right? until the new pathway becomes the easy pathway. But it doesn't become the easy pathway at the beginning. It's a process. Right? It's a process. Now, I remember the day. <laughs> I remember the day. You see, I had these negative thoughts running through my head all the time, all the time, all the time. And after this whole crisis and everything with my wife, and I was about to leave, and now I surrendered everything, and now my wife and I were like in the land of transparency. All right, I don't want anything between us. I don't want any secrets. I don't want anything of that nature. And so we would, you know, we would kind of connect with each other at the end of a day, and she'd say, okay, well, how's this going? How's this going? You know, your temptation's here, and, and, and so on. And I was, I was being being honest, you know, and it's kind of uncomfortable sometimes to be honest about the stuff you're struggling with and, and, and whatever, but, uh, but I was, and, and uh, you know, one day, it was probably a couple months into this process, and she said, so how are the thoughts today? Oh, praise God, hallelujah! I didn't have one that I can remember today. And I didn't know that I could go a minute without this stuff running through my head. And now I had gone a whole day without having one of these thoughts run through my head. Praise God, hallelujah! Right? Now, it wasn't the end of the battle. I still had, you know, stuff coming up later and, and, and whatever, but it was the first real revelation to me that, whoa, hang on, this is actually working. Wow, this is actually working. And then I discovered dreams were a problem. <laughs> you know, I'd, I'd, be in my, I'd be sleeping, and in my dreams, I'd be right back in my addictions. Yeah, be right back, and I'd be giving in, and I'd be, you know, participating, I'd be doing all this kind of stuff, and I'd wake up, and my heart's beating, I'm sweating, I'm just, you know, and I'm like, oh, God, thank you. That was just a dream. But those days when I had those dreams, it was a hard day. A lot of struggle, a lot of struggle with those thoughts and everything like that. And I, I had to come to realize, you know what? I'm not responsible for my dreams. I'm not. I'm not responsible for my dreams. I can't control it. So when I woke up from a morning of having those dreams, then I'd had to say, all right, Lord, well, you got it. I'm not going to take any guilt from that because I couldn't control it. But one thing I began to discover later a few years down the line, I started getting victory even in my dreams. Amen. Yeah, I started, no, in my dreams. And, and so my dreams started clearing up, but it was a few years later. They were kind of trailing a few years behind what my thought processes had been. So I recommend that individuals take one, two, or three, not more than three, three by five cards at any given time. Do not get a Rolodex. I have a friend, she has a Rolodex of promise cards, and she's got like a hundred and some in there. I mean, it's like going to the battlefield and having like all of these weapons around, and the enemy comes to attack, and you're like, um, <laughs> um, where'd that one go? I know this guy's not, he's going to be defeated by that one, but I can't find it. Where is it? <laughs> you know, you're dead. So have a few weapons, know them well, use them well, have them available. I put my three by five cards, oh, hang on, I got something in the way. I didn't put it in this. I put my three by five cards right here because I pretty much always have my wallet with me. 
unless I was swimming or sleeping or something like that. But um, so it was pretty much always with me. So I had my three by five cards. So if I needed to, I pull them out, start reading it out loud. Now there's the four second rule. What's that? Well, when you notice, when you know that you're thinking one of these negative thoughts, you've got four seconds. Pull out your card, start reading it out loud. Gives you enough time to do it, but not enough time to keep playing around with those thoughts. Now, you might have been thinking it and on that train of thought process for the last hour and a half, and you were just kind of in autopilot, and you didn't realize what you were doing. But when you come to realize what you're doing, now you got four seconds. Get that card out, pull it out, read it out loud, and start going to battle. Now, there's other negative thoughts as well, like I'm unloved. Right? Other lies that we believed. So what's the truth? Yeah. I have loved you with an everlasting love, therefore with loving kindness I have drawn you. So if you're feeling unloved, get your Jeremiah 31 3 card, your, your unloved card. I have loved you with an everlasting love, therefore with loving kindness I have drawn you. Thank you, Lord, for giving me the truth of your word. I choose to believe that I am loved because you said so. Thank you for loving me. And you go to battle, just like you did with the other ones. Right? Maybe, maybe it's not unlove. Maybe it's not uh, <clears throat> the failure. Maybe it's guilt. Maybe that's what you're struggling with. Sorry, somebody was going to take a picture of it. There you go. So maybe it's guilt that you're struggling with. All right? <clears throat> well, that's fine. So what do you do about guilt? Well, I had this thought. I've been too bad to be forgiven. Right? Well, life is pretty dark and pretty miserable when that's your thought process. Right? I've been too bad to be forgiven. So what's the truth? First John 1 John 1.9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and will cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Right? Beautiful promise. So take your guilty card. First John 1 John 1.9. If I confess my sins, I like to do it in the first person. If I confess my sins, you are faithful and just to forgive me of my sins and to cleanse me from all unrighteousness. Thank you, Lord, for giving me the truth of your word. I choose to believe that I am forgiven because you said so. Thank you for forgiving me. And go to battle. And with whatever the issue is, you can go to battle in the same way. And the Lord is the one who brings about victory, but he can't bring about victory if you're not involved in the battle. Because the battleground is your mind. Right? It's your mind. So what I recommend is a thought journal. Right? A thought journal. So writing down uh, the various different thoughts that you have running through your head over the, last, over the next day, maybe two, max. Right? It doesn't have to be a long process. It should be a short process. And then categorizing those thoughts. Do those th are those thoughts of fear or worry or anxiety? Are they thoughts of being unloved or want unwanted or rejected? Is it uh, thoughts of failure or defeat? Is it thoughts of guilt or shame or self-hatred? Are they thoughts of unworthiness or inadequacy? Are they thoughts of bitterness or anger, revenge? or loneliness and abandonment and so on, right? So, and, and this is not a, you know, a complete list. It's just an idea of, uh, of, a, of a type of, you know, a list of categories that you would put things under. And then categorize your thoughts, all right? And then choose your top one, two, or three categories. So let's say that you're, um, you know, you're a, 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 an anxious uh, individual and so anxiety is a really big issue well then there's fear and worry thoughts that are going on and those are going to be quite problematic if that's the biggest thing on your issue make sure you've got an anxiety card right? so what is it that is countering fear or worry well maybe it's Isaiah 41:10. fear not for I am with you be not dismayed for I am your God I will strengthen you yes I will help you I will uphold you with my righteous right hand so whatever it is, find a Bible promise that speaks to you the opposite of whatever that category is, and then get your sword. Write that promise down on the three by five card, and then follow it with a prayer of faith. Thank you, Lord, for giving me the truth of your word. I choose to believe whatever the promise says, because you said so. Thank you for accomplishing whatever the promise promises. 
and you go to battle. All right, so this might not have seemed like a health seminar. Not on the usual line of a, of a health seminar, right? But it has everything to do with health. It really has everything to do with health. We're told disease is an effort of nature to free the system from conditions that result from a violation of the laws of health. And we're told in the case of sickness, the first point is the, the what? The cause. the cause should be ascertained. Right? We need to look for the cause. And the cause, as we have seen through this series, is almost always found here. Right? It's almost always found here. Not always, but it's almost always found here. Right? And we're told that sickness of the mind prevails everywhere, that nine-tenths of diseases from which men suffer have their foundation here. Is that true? If that's true, it makes sense that if you're hunting for the cause, you should aim for the target. And the target is the mind, right? So if you're looking for the cause of the disease, go looking to the mind the vast majority of the time, you're going to find it. That's where you're going to find it. Right? If you go looking elsewhere, well, a little bit of the time, you might find it elsewhere. But the majority of the time, you're going to, uh, the vast majority of the time, you're going to find it right there going to the mind. So that's where we need to aim. So we have this old miserable heart of giving to receive, thinking that I'm God, a slave to others. It's mine. My gain is to receive. And if I don't receive enough or I don't receive anything or I lose my treasure, now I'm at loss and so on. This is the miserable heart. And then here we have the new heart that God has for us, which is free, beautiful. I'm a creature. I take to give. He has everything that I need. And the more I can give, the more gain that I have. It's just beautiful, right? Now, where does the vast majority of disease come from? It comes from this loss, from taking things personally. It's about me. It's mine. It's my loss. And now I'm the one that's having to pay for it or having to suffer through it. It's mine. And where does that come from? It comes from this heart. It comes from this perspective. So how am I ever going to fix that? What do I need? If it's coming from here and the losses, how do I get away from the losses? I need a new heart. I need a new heart. Because the new heart takes away the losses. Because it doesn't matter how much they give, they're not my source, I'm not taking from them. It doesn't matter if they don't give anything they're not my source. I'm not taking from them. God is. I'm taking from him. He has everything I need. It doesn't matter if something is, a, is lost here on this earth because I don't have an earthly treasure. It's a heavenly treasure, and you can never lose the heavenly treasure. So that new heart takes away the losses, and if, the, if you remove the major thing that leads to disease, guess what happens to the disease? Yeah. So the major solution to disease is a new heart. It's a new heart. Right. Now, cause and effect, we talked about that, right? My disease must have a cause. The cause always precedes or goes before the disease. And as long as the disease is present and it's a process, which diseases are, then the cause or its secondary causes are still present. And if the cause is a love or a sin issue, I can do all the lifestyle I want to and natural remedies and treatments and this and that and the other thing. I can do it up one side and down the other and flip around and continue trying to do it any which way. If I succeed in taking away the effect and the cause remains, some other manifestation must come to reveal the presence of the cause. Right? So the cause must be removed. That's the key. The cause must be removed. And once the cause is removed, then the effect will go away because the effect cannot produce itself. 
Now, there's some in the meantime things, right? So while you're uh, wondering what the cause is and asking God to reveal it to you and cooperating with him in that process, we also, yes, we apply lifestyle, you know, we treat that this is his body, so we need to treat it the way that he would want it to be treated and put in it what he designed to be put in it and so on. And yes, there's natural remedies that he gives us that are simple, that are inexpensive, that are available and, and so on that we can use in the process of helping and restoration. And yes, there's the elimination of toxins that was in that, that uh, Ministry of Healing, page 127 quote. Um, and so, you know, improving sweating and liver function and kidney function so that you can urinate and detoxify and other things of that nature, all that's fine. And then pray and trust that God will work it out and he will work it out in his time. Don't become anxious about it. Now, some people will focus on it and they'll go, okay, there's a cause here. I've got to find the cause. I've got to focus on the cause. 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 got to find the cause. got to find the cause. got to focus on the cause. got to focus on the cause. got to find the cause. got to find the cause. Guess what? It'll kill you because you're trying to do it and you're trying to make it happen. No, you come to God. He knows and not only does he have the truth, but truth always has a time. Truth always has a time. So ask him to reveal it to you and trust him that he will when it's time. When it's time. And trust him that it'll come about in his time that he'll reveal it to you. Right? So don't go around anxious all this time. Now, Final points, our real issue is an identity crisis. Right? Our real issue is an identity crisis. And this is the foundation of all of the issues that we deal with. It's an identity crisis and that identity crisis that you and I, each of us struggle with is this one. I'm God. That's the fundamental identity crisis came down to, to you and I from Satan through Adam and Eve and on down the line, right? You will be like God. Now, what does that do to us? How does it manifest? Because these are the key points when it comes to looking for the cause for the issues, right? This next slide. So there's the lie that I'm God, and there's the truth, I'm a child of God, right? The truth is I'm a child of God, that's the true identity, the false identity is that I am God. Now what is this false identity that I am God, what does it do to me? Well, I see myself as my own. Right? I see myself as my own. And that has a whole bunch of ramifications. Because if I see myself as my own, if I see myself as mine, well then, I've got to protect me. I've got to take charge of others related to me, right? Um, I, uh, it's my loss when something is taken advantage of and so on, there's a whole, slew of things that come from this. But when I believe the truth that I'm God's child, then guess what? I'm not my own. I'm his. Right? I'm not my own. I'm his. So can he take care of what is his own? Yes, he can. Now, there are individual responsibilities that you and I have that he's not going to take over. We have the freedom to choose for ourselves and choose what we will put in and what we won't and so on. But there are things that are outside of our choice, like time and environment and space and circumstances and people and animals and toxins and whatever it might be. There's a whole bunch of stuff that you and I cannot control that is outside of ourselves. And if we are his, 
Can he do something about that? Yeah. He said you can pick up serpents and drink poison. But that's not going around and going, oh, look, it's a serpent. Oh, it's poisonous. Oh. No. It's when you're about his business and following his direction in your life, you don't have to worry about all of those other things. He will control it. He'll take care of it. You don't have to live in fear of all of these different things. And why did he say poison? Because that's how they got rid of people. Quite easy. Just put some poison in something that you drank, and you drank it, and then you're gone. Right? That's why kings had cupbearers, because that's how they took care of people. Right? So if I'm God, then it is or they are mine. I'm the owner. Right? I'm the owner. So if that's the case and it's mine, what do I have to do with them and it? I've got to control it because it's mine. Whereas the truth tells us that it or they are his. I'm not the owner, I'm a steward. And so, yes, I have a responsibility of the stewardship, the things that God has given to me, and stewardship is only given to me for a time. Only for a time. If, it's, if I see myself as the owner, then I believe, and of course I believe that I'm God, then I believe that it should be mine for... Ever. So I should never lose it. Or it should never be taken away from me. But if I'm a steward and my stewardship is always only for a time, then every stewardship will be taken away at some point. Not because you're bad, but simply because that's the nature of stewardship. You get stewardship of this responsibility now, and then it's taken away from you, and you get another responsibility, and so on. So, the lie that I am God makes me believe what is done is done to me. Yeah, it's all about me. It's selfish. Right? But the truth says that what is done is done to him. It's not personal. If it's done to me, it's personal. I take it personally. It'll kill me because it's based off of a lie. Fundamental lie. I'm God. What you did, you did to me. If it's done to me, and if it's my own, if I'm God, then it's my loss. So it's a personal loss. But if I have the truth that I'm God's child, it's not my loss. I can't be at loss. It's impossible for us to be at loss. It's actually impossible. The idea or the thought that we're at loss is simply a deception. It's a lie. If you are born with nothing, uh, Job chapter 1 and verse 21, the Lord gave, no, naked I came into this world, and naked shall I leave, right? The Lord gave, and the Lord is taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. If you were born with nothing, and you die with nothing. If you begin and end with nothing, how much do you have to lose? Nothing. 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 It's impossible for us to lose anything. Now, if you have something, it's because God gave it. But he didn't give it for you to be the owner. He gave it for you to be the steward. And he gave the stewardship for a time. And at some time, the stewardship will be removed. Is that because he's an angry ogre? No. no. It's just the time for that stewardship is done. And that is true for relationships. It's true for people. It's true for possessions. It's true for capacities. It's true for everything in our lives. There's a time. Right? The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Where do we get the blessed be the name of the Lord? Thank you, Lord, for the time we had. Thank you for the 51 years of marriage that we had before 
that stewardship was removed. Thank you for the, the 11 years that we had with that child before that stewardship was removed. Thank you for, because when I was born, I didn't have them. When I die, I wouldn't take them with me. But praise God for the 11 years. Praise God for the 51 years. Praise God for the 35 years. Praise God for the time you gave. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Right? If I'm God, then I must fix the problems. Because they're my problems. And I must control. If I'm God's child, then he will fix the problems. I simply trust and cooperate. Right? And if I am God, then I must be worshipped and served. How does that manifest? I expect you to accept me. I expect you to love me. I expect you to understand me. I expect you to respect me, yes, you know, and so on, right? So I expect worship from you and service from you because I'm God. But if the truth came in, the truth is, as God's child, I must worship and serve. That's why God created me. Now, I can't do that without first taking, but my joy and meaning and purpose comes in taking to give, give right? To give. And so it is not for me to be loved by somebody else. It's for me to take that love from God, and I am loved by him, right? And when I say somebody else, I mean other people. Yes, it is for me to be loved by God. It is for me to be understood by God. It is for me to be accepted by God. It is for me to be respected by God, and so on. But when it comes to other people, it is for me to respect them, whether they respect me or not. It is for me to accept them, whether they do or don't. It's for me to give them a place of belonging, whether they would give me one or not. Right? Because I take that from God, and I give it to others. This lie is the foundation of disease. And this truth is the foundation of health. And when, by the grace of God, he restores us from the lie to the truth, so comes the restoration from disease to health. So one last iteration. The law of God shows us that our purpose in life is to take from him and to give to others. And that is love. And it can be messed up if we don't take. We just end up being a dry riverbed. River bed. But it can be messed up if we take and we try to keep it to ourselves because it'll ruin everything. Right? The only way that it works is if we take to give. And if we take from the wrong source, it's going to be bad. And so God's jealous that we might take from the only good source, which is him. And we come and we take good from God and we give good to others. And that is the solution. Last quote, and we're done. When the gospel is received in its purity and power, it is a cure for the maladies that originated in sin. What is a cure for the maladies that originated in sin? The gospel, the gospel received in its purity and power is a cure. How many maladies originated in sin? Did diabetes originate in sin? Did hypertension originate in sin? Did cancer originate in sin? Did autoimmune diseases originate in sin? And a cure for them is? 
the gospel received in its purity and power. Welcome to the Law of Life. It's been a pleasure being with you. If you want to con connect in the future, well, we're getting the website up and going. That's npmen.org. But the email is info at npmen.org. Right? Info at npmen.org. So if you want to connect sometime in the future, I'd love to hear from you. It's been a pleasure. I love you guys. I'm so glad God gave us the opportunity to be here and spend this time together. Ricky has the last remnants of stuff back there at the table for those that are interested in. Question. If you want to get books later, if you're looking at single copies, then Amazon.com. The book is on Amazon. Or, or yes, we'll have it on uh, npmen.org. And if you want bulk orders of books at, uh, at a discounted rate, then uh, contact me there at info at npmen.org, and uh, we can arrange that. So the ABC as well will be able to... Yes, and the ABC is carrying the book as well. And uh, they have been very gracious to us. Um, let's pray. Yeah. Dear Heavenly Father, what an awesome God. <laughs> what a beautiful God that you are and how simple, simple things you have put together. We see that our purpose in life is to take from you everything that we need, that we might be full and pass it on to others, and our joy will be complete. And so, Lord, help us to be those channels of your grace, and in being that channel, Lord, set us free from the things that bind us, from the lies that plague us. Give us a new heart and a new mind to know that we are children of God, that we are dependent upon you, and that we must come take everything that we need from you that we might be free. This we pray, and thank you for answering. In Jesus' name, amen.